first. So welcome everyone to this presentation we have planned for you. Very happy to have Ellen Carley, Alaska State Museum conservator and Steph Kidera here. She was an intern with Ellen who came here in July to work on a selection of fish traps and also make sure that we were getting ready as we needed to for the upcoming roof renovation project in the summer. So they're gonna be sharing some of the images and details of the work that they did in July on the fish traps and also an overview of some priorities for larger exhibition renovation. So with that, I'll mute everyone and then have Steph unmute and we can begin. Thanks for being here. All right, well, good afternoon to you all. I'm so honored to be speaking to the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum. Your support and curiosity are so important and I'm excited to share with you my experiences working at the Sheldon Jackson Museum last summer. Jackie, Robert and Sue were such generous hosts and the opportunity to see this unmatched collection in the beautiful city of Sitka was truly amazing. I am speaking to you today, not from Southeastern Alaska, unfortunately, but from Washington, DC, the traditional lands of the Nokochank and Piscataway peoples who were forced off their land or killed by colonizers. I am inspired by indigenous art, technologies and beautiful spirits and hope to support, promote and preserve the cultures that many have tried to erase. And that brings me to my journey to this place of passion and reverence for cultural heritage materials and the narratives behind them. I spent most of my life in Minneapolis, the land of the Dakota. There I studied art, painted portraits and worked in hospitality to pay the bills. Years after college, I found out about the profession of art conservation. Excited about the idea of working with art but not having to sell my own, I went back to school to prepare myself for applying to graduate programs in conservation. There is a need for art studio practice or knowledge and what we refer to as hand skills as the work can be extremely detailed and fragile pieces. Art history knowledge also is needed to establish context and makers techniques and chemistry to understand the chemical makeup and degradation patterns of each artwork or historic object. I prepared for graduate school for five years, studying chemistry, interning with various institutions and private conservators in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. I worked on murals within dioramas at a natural history museum, fine art paintings, furniture, monumental sculpture, archeological artifacts, and many more items. I decided that objects would be my focus for conservation loving the idea that the pieces I was preserving had been made and used by many people before me. In 2018, I joined nine classmates in Buffalo, New York to continue my education in art conservation. Pictured here are two projects I worked on in my first year, illustrating the range of materials and conditions we are trained to address. And here's a very satisfying after treatment shot. At Buffalo State, I learned specific material chemistry for cultural heritage objects, paints, and coatings, how to identify materials, document damage and treatment, repair techniques, and ethical considerations we encounter as conservators. This last piece has always perked my interest as many Western artists and museums collections have generations of scholars who study what's right or what's wrong for certain pieces. But what do we do with artifacts in which the culture is still very much alive? I had read Ellen Carley's writings about her experiences in Alaska working for the State Museum and the need for collaboration with cultural stakeholders to preserve art and artifacts. And I knew that I wanted to learn more about this from her. Ellen graciously agreed to take me on as an intern in a summer of a pandemic, racial injustice awakening and global uncertainty. I traveled to Juneau taking all of the necessary precautions and measures to do so safely. There I learned from and worked with Ellen over a period of seven weeks. In Juneau, we worked on a torn Yupik summer gut parka, experimented with natural dyes and the combination with indigo as shown in the video here. 
Our goal was to try to solve the mystery of the historic blue yarn and the Chilkat dancing blankets. This was a very full summer of critical thought and hands-on training. A big highlight of my summer was our trip to Sitka to do work for the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Now I, someone who has never before gone fishing, got to learn about native fishing practices through these model fish traps in the Sheldon Jackson collection. These very helpful illustrations of the making of fish traps by Milo Minoc helped me familiarize myself with fish traps on a whole and prepared me for the work ahead. The simplicity of the design to simply encourage fish to swim into a trap by using fencing and funnels is genius. So is the construction of these large traps. We got a feeling for the scale in these drawings and the traps as the traps would be large, strong and sturdy, and able to withstand moving water and potentially thrashing fish. Around 1994, the storage drawer suffered a fall, causing damage to eight of the 14 model fish traps it held. In 2009, the traps were surveyed, which is a, a, an important step in the process, actually assessing the damage and estimating the time needed for a conservator to mend the traps was imperative. The size of these models ranged from 12 to 20 inches in length and exhibited a variety of issues. Some traps had historic photographs and others contained clues within each fragment to rebuild the trap model correctly. My goal of treatment was to return these pieces to their original configuration and ensure their stability for future display. I'm going to walk you through four of these eight treatments. I'll touch on materials, technique, and the decisions that I made in treating them. And I started with the simpler traps, ones that had less damage or more straightforward repairs. This trap model had become unattached and had one loose broken piece. The configuration of the three-part trap as a whole was straightforward. However, since I did not have photographic evidence of the exact configuration, the funnel trap, which was unattached, remained unattached and was placed just so in the picture. The fragment piece was from the mouth of the square end of the one funnel. This was known because there was one missing spoke in the square opening. I simply placed the spoke back in place and the neighboring components enabled a pressure fit, so no adhesive was needed. The next trap I'm sharing is a bit different than the others because it involves quite a bit of thin string instead of root lashings. The first thing I noticed about this trap is that the shape of the opening is oval where the rest were round. This is because this trap seems to have been crushed by something. The second issue is that the inner funnel is also crushed and it is tangled by the string within. So I had a cone, an inner cone, and thread keeping it all together. Ideally, after treatment, it could still be in this configuration, but before I could make that judgment call, I had to investigate it further. When looking at the spiral construction of this trap, the fact that it was crushed means that the spiral, spiral root is broken in at least 10 places. The string is the only thing that's holding it together. I'm highlighting it here, the breaks on just one side of the trap. Each break edge is now out of alignment because of the natural properties of wood. In general, these traps were made from green or wet roots and small bits of wood. Wood when wet can be bent and twisted. When held under tension while drying, the wood will remain in this shape. However, when any event happens, which could be extreme temperature or change in humidity or physical force, the wood's memory can return and the wood will want to be in its original, usually straight-ish conformation. Aged brittle wood is no longer flexible and I could not bend these edges to meet and therefore repair them. My recommendation for this outer conical piece is to create rigid circular support from the inside. This may allow for break edge alignment and will definitely return the trap closer to its original profile. For the time being, I could only just clean the exterior of this cone and focus on the inner cone. I untied the separate pieces that were securing the inner cone in place, which you can see on the bottom right here, um, just two small bits of string and removed it. The cone was in two separate pieces with inches of loose curled thread and three fragments. Spending time with this piece allowed me to understand the pattern of the pigmented wood. 
Each splint was alternating blue and red. I had a blue and a red splint loose and lots of string between the severed halves. I discovered the pattern of the string lashings through examining the intact areas shown in the diagram I made. Now the hard part. This piece was literally unraveling as I touched it. I didn't have enough hands to keep all of the components in place. Plus, as you can see with my hand for scale, it is very small. I tried to weave the loose thread around the splints and these miniature closed pins helped immensely. Once I had everything as close to complete as the materials would allow, I added a dot of clear synthetic resin to hold the string in place. And this resin can be removed at a later time if that is necessary. This after treatment image may not be the one I was hoping for, but by salvaging the pieces of the inner cone and storing it next to and not inside the larger cone, the model as a whole is just more stable. Also, this means the components are much more visible. Should the model be required for research or display, it can easily be identified and requires less handling. I did secure the smaller cone piece to the larger by using that original piece of small string. This third trap was even more complicated. With many fragments and loose pieces I had to rely on clues within the elements in order to put it back together. These spiraled funnels were made so well and formed so tightly when the wood and root were wet that even a fall did not disturb them. But many of the now aged and brittle ends of the long pieces broke and the pieces that were fit into notches or holes in the wooden base were now disassociated. As a side note, my personal favorite element of these models had to be the fish. These three small carved fish were perhaps meant to show scale of the traps, but without a doubt, they illustrate the utility. I spoke briefly to looking for clues within the fragments for placement when I didn't have references. The things I was looking for were any presence of glue from a previous repair, notches and loose sinew, and dark or light lines. Materials age differently upon exposure to light. You may notice with photographs, for example, that they fade over time. But some materials, like oil paint and wood, namely resinous materials, darken with light exposure due to oxidation. These lighter areas told me that the wood was in contact with another material in that spot, either another wooden piece or a lashing. The image on the left illustrates on the bottoms of these crossed pieces are inserted into holes and that the top lashing is slipped from its original space. On the top right, the symmetry of the posts and notches pointed to the, its configuration. And on the bottom right, that unattached loop of sinew fit in the, on the notch in the base perfectly. The other side of the base had the same properties still intact. One of the other models I treated had carved wooden fish loose inside of the funnel. For this trap, I placed the fish associated with it inside the back funnel before conjoining them. In this way, working with similar, multiple similar pieces can be very informative. As in the first treatment I showed, pieces that could simply be fresh, pressure fit were. For pieces that needed just a bit of reinforced support, I secured with a piece of silk thread, an almost invisible string. If glue was necessary, I used a non-toxic water-based archival paste, similar to Elmer's glue, but at a conservation grade, which means that there are no materials within itself that will harm the object as it ages. This glue swells with moisture, so if my repair needs to be reversed someday in the future, a conservator will be able to safely do so. In addition, I took detailed notes and photographs of my repairs so that the next person to look at these traps will know the interventions that I made. Of the eight traps I repaired in four days, this one was the last. It had many loose pieces and not a lot of clues within for placement. But thankfully, Jackie was able to find this old Polaroid, which while the detail isn't clear due to the size, it showed the overall layout of the trap model and it helped me know where to put the figures and the bent pieces. And this lower right image shows the bent pieces in place, which slid into a small notch on the base. And it's almost microscopic. It's right at the bottom there. And without the photo, I don't know that I would have noticed exactly where that went back. The above right images show the figure above um, the trap is secured. 
The blue thread tied around the figure was a helpful clue as a long piece of wood had a notch cut into it and had slight blue pigmentation of the same shade. This comes from years of being tight against the blue string. With these specific clues, I was able to put the loose pieces back in their proper conformation and without introducing new materials like glue. Staying true to the method of manufacture and the hands that made them is important when possible. It is such a privilege to touch these elements and see them up close, to see the bite marks on these small pieces of wood showing how they were bent, to observe the mastery of which people made these models so, del so delicate and so small. In the end for this model, I wasn't able to get every single piece back in order, but the majority was back in place thanks to the picture. And again, I took detailed pictures of my work and the pieces that were still loose are kept in a sealed bag with the accession number and kept near the piece. My time in Alaska, though brief, was incredibly impactful. I am grateful to the Yupik and Athabascan peoples for sharing their mastery and skill. I am forever changed by this experience and I'm so grateful to Jackie, Robert, Sue, the Sheldon Jackson Museum, the Friends, Alaska State Museum, and most of all, Ellen, for her mentorship and guidance and friendship. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Steph, that was wonderful. Um, so everyone knows we will be having a Q&A at the end with both Steph and Ellen, and we will have uh, Steph have you mute now, and we'll have Ellen begin for her presentation portion. Thank you. Okay, I'll just try to share my screen here. folks can see that okay. I am the conservator. Whoops, screen sharing has stopped. So the window is closed. Let me try that again. Sorry about that, folks. And have a vintage laptop here in Juneau. Ellen, what happens when you select the green share screen at the bottom? It did work and then the PowerPoint uh, went away for a moment. So I had to relaunch the PowerPoint. Sorry about okay. that. So um, hopefully that'll open up again. Well, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Rasmussen Foundation provided the grant to fund Ellen and Steph coming to Sitka to work on this project. And the Rasmussen Foundation grant is also going to fund Ellen's next trip, which will happen this summer, along with another intern. Steph was wonderful, but we have to give someone else a chance. So. Um, she'll be coming back with a new intern who could not make it here this past summer, and we can't wait to host them.
So are you seeing it now? Perfect. Technology. Okay, so I'm Ellen Carley. I'm the conservator at the Alaska State Museum and, and also the conservator for the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And like you folks in um, Sitka, I'm on Linkit Ani, which is a Clinkit land, but I'm here in Juneau, specifically in downtown Juneau, which is Wushkitan and Tlenedi clan land. And I'm trying to be a good guest um, in this place where they have lived for thousands of years. So I'll be sharing with you today a couple of projects I was assisting with this past summer and uh, some images of details I hope you'll find interesting. There is an upcoming roof project. You can see Steph here walking past the um, backside of the Sheldon Jackson Museum and the um, wood roof that's on the building now. That roof has some flaws that needs to be replaced. You uh, can see this roof of a nearby house that we saw when we were there this summer, which I think is just gorgeous, but that's not really the kind of roof we need on a museum. And the um, roof will be replaced with asphalt shingles, which will match the rest of the Sheldon Jackson campus. The um, folks here learned after the archives flood in 2009 that roofing projects can be a liability for um, an institution and whether it can you know, tear off the um, precautions that might be put in place by the roofers. And so we do take these kinds of events seriously. And we've been um, thinking about what we need to do to protect the collection, you know, just in case something might happen during the roofing project. One thing I want to share is some of the things I learned about Sheldon Jackson's roof. One of the things about the building you might know if you know the building is how thick the walls are on the building, actually, which you can really see when you walk into the gallery, which is the image on the left, that the, the concrete walls of the building, the original octagon are very thick. And on the right, there's a plan from the architectural drawing that shows kind of the roofing scheme. And that octagon um, actually has the original roof still on it under the roof that we see today. So when they did renovations on the building um, 30 years ago or so, they added, um, steel structures on the four, the eight pillars on the corners have um, steel that goes up to kind of a ring around the cupola on the roof. And then the, the second roof is on top of that. So there's sort of a double roof up there. And you can tell where that is. If you look up on the building today, you see a fascia, kind of a um, dark area before the roof starts. If you look at the first slide in my presentation and compare it to the first slide in Steph's presentation, um, you could actually see the, the difference in height between the two roofs. And here's a, a bit of a cross section from the architectural plan that shows the, um, the structure up there. The cupola is actually getting some more attention this year too. The, um, the windows and the uh, structure up there are getting a second layer that is going to visually look similar, but is going to um, be more uh, protective from the environment. So some of the things we were thinking about in terms of protecting from uh, both leaks, if anything happened during the construction period, and also dust that might filter down through the, the roof with the construction activity. So there's a diagram here, you won't be able to see the details uh, too well, but to know that we measured out how much plastic tarping it would take to cover all the exhibits in, inside the building. And the project managers from the Department of Transportation, DOT manages our buildings, project managers were there discussing with us the, um, the ideas of, of how to prevent dust and leaks. They went up on the roof and stomped on it so that we could look up in the light fixtures and see if there was any dust filtering down or anything like that to get a sense of um, if uh, that was going to happen. The hanging kayaks, we were looking to see would they sway at all with people walking around on the roof and they didn't, but we were still requesting that when they brought up the bundles of shingles that they would set them down with the crane on the opposite side of the building from where the kayaks were, those kinds of, of thoughts. We were also lucky that Sheldon Jackson has really good in institutional memory. Like, you know, several of you that are members of the Friends are former employees who have moved on or retired. Lisa Baikonin came in and helped us look through the records of the last time the roof got 
repaired. So those sorts of activities really helped us um, come up with a mitigation plan for those, um, those risks that uh, might be upcoming with the project. So now I'm going to switch over to the other project I was working on, which is um, thinking ahead for uh, conservation concerns for the gallery refurbishment. And here's an image of the last time the galleries um, got a, um, a lot of attention. The galleries we see today were uh, installed in the mid 80s. And there might be folks you recognize from, um, from this uh, image. I, I can see on the far left, Peter Corey, the former curator there. On the, um, in the back, there's a, a mustached gentleman. That's Bruce Cotto, who used to be the head of the museums. Um, a few years back on the right are um, you know conservators and exhibit folks but if you know some of the folks in this image i i uh, be curious to have that for the records over here this is another image of the crew back in the 80s on coffee break um, i'm sure that was a, a really um, fun project um, back then but there hasn't been a ton done in the galleries since so 30 plus years of wear and tear on those white exhibit cases uh, um, is really starting to show up. And about 20 years ago, there was, uh, or maybe 10, I think there were new canisters put up on the lights on the ceiling. And when that lighting change happened, you could really see the difference in the paint regimes that happened on the outsides of the cases and the chips and the nicks and the dents. There's also inside the cases, um, various uh, exhibit upgrades that we're hoping to to be able to do. There's um, plywood in some of the cases. There are some exhibit mounts that could use some refreshing. There's also lighting questions that um, are, are being considered. There's a number of places in the cases that are, are kind of dark and visibility isn't great, particularly on these cases that are the freestanding cases and in, in toward the middle of the room. If you look up in the ceiling of those freestanding cases, you can see there are some old uh, fluorescent light fixtures up in there, which suggests that maybe at some point they were able to be lit. And there is a rumor that some of these exhibit cases might have electrical outlets in the floor beneath them, which we're not sure about. So um, consideration of those uh, lighting regimes as part of it. Another lighting fixture issue is on the wall cases, which have these really lovely fiber optic lighting systems that have done a lot to light those cases. But that fiber optic system is probably 20 years old. You can see um, on the right what that equipment looks like and you access it through the tops of these cases, which is a little awkward. Um, so repairing and maintaining these systems is difficult for um, access purposes, but also because parts aren't really available anymore and the equipment is going obsolete. So overall, a, a lighting upgrade for the cases is necessary. There may or may not be some degree of um, changing out of things that are in the cases. That's kind of a curatorial decision. But for example, this case, which uh, has some uh, cross-cultural um, uh, beads and blankets and whatnot, these things are kind of stacked one on top of each other. And that's not really great. Um, exhibit technique anymore. Some of those things that get stacked on each other, like for example, there's this open chest here that the weight of those blankets is kind of putting stresses unevenly on the artifact. And when things are stacked on each other and they're touching the oils or the dyes, you know, they can be um, stains transferred and whatnot. So this isn't really a, an ideal um, display technique anymore. And there's also some ambiguity in this particular case, what's an exhibit prop and what's really part of the collection. We know from our own records and our database what is, but it doesn't show up very well in the labels, for example. So those are curatorial um, considerations, but if Jackie decided she wanted to change some of these things, then that would impact um, how we prepare the artifacts that might switch out. This is something I didn't know about for a long time. This little map at the back of the gallery is color coded to the color of paint that's in the bottom of a lot of the cases. Now the map in the back of the room is faded, so um, the colors aren't accurate anymore, but um, that's something that's being thought about is if those color schemes are gonna be kept or not. I'll get back to why that's important in a couple minutes, but before I go too far into like all the things that need to be improved in the galleries, I wanna stress how really wonderful 
beautiful the galleries are and how much still is right in the galleries and and how much um, is still really good, I think, exhibit technology. And one of the things I want to point out is the dance bib that's in the lower corner there, the one with the frog on it, this really nice uh, plexiglass support that is in the case. If you really are interested in this item, you can kind of get down low and peek behind and you can see the floral fabric that's behind it and some of the construction techniques. So I think that's still really good quality exhibit technique. There's some things though that, that could use some help. Some of the risers and the pedestals are undersized for the objects that they should be supporting. There's um, this boat, for example, has carpeting that is um, the straps that support the boat. And we could really upgrade that to something better. Some of the items on the tops of the wall cases, you, you might not see it so easily from the ground, but aren't really as well supported as they could be. The item in front of the window is an anchor. There's a couple of those up there actually, which are really, uh, really amazing artifacts. But like so many of the wood things in the collection, they, um, they have past insect damage. So a lot of the wood things in the Sheldon Jackson Museum collection had a wood boring insect infestation back in the 70s before they were part of the state's collection. And that makes the wood items more delicate than you um, might anticipate just by looking at them. This item particularly too, I'm curious if the, um, if the wire um, item, uh, the wire part of this construction is original or if it's um, something that happened later on as in, during its museum career, because there's also um, plant-based cordage remnants on, the, on this object. So a little research to um, get a sense of uh, what's what belongs with this object as well as some better support because it's kind of cantilevered off into space. The totem poles in the middle, folks that are familiar with the um, exhibit set up here um, are aware that these totem poles are uh, lashed to these um, vertical steel pillars and they're secure, but these cables and turnbuckles that go around the necks of the figures are, are really not so nice. And it would be great if we could upgrade that to something um, better than that. Other mount ladies in the uh, galleries might include things like these snowshoes that are just leaning against the walls of the case. Over time, you know, those uneven stresses and pressures can um, distort the object. The grass socks are um, kind of leaning away from each other and the original um, grass um, strap on the back of the heels that um, traditionally held them together for storage is, is being stressed in this configuration. There are a few things like the um, basket on the left that are, are really tight in the case. Now this isn't actually being squished or crushed, like there's not something physically going wrong with this object, but when you're viewing it, it looks uncomfortable. It makes the viewer feel uncomfortable. So it's nice if those kinds of things can be corrected and give that object a little um, breathing space for aesthetic purposes. Uh, the item that's on the right that I'm uh, pointing out is a shovel that's mounted on the wall and it's securely mounted on the wall, but one of the exhibit techniques back then was to use some of the plastic strapping through an original hole that was in the middle of the shovel in order to help secure it to the wall. And that's a little bit visually distracting and the plastic strapping also ages over time. And so it'd be good if we came up with something a little nicer than that. There are um, throughout the middle of the room, these fantastic study storage drawers that um, contain even more objects that people can open and close the drawers and look at them. And I would say of the hundreds of items in those drawers, there's maybe 20 or 30 that regularly shift with the opening and closing of the doors. And so every, couple of years, they um, need to be repositioned in their drawers. And Robert Hoffman's a past master at how to get into these drawers and, and use our suction cups to um, rearrange those items. And we've documented his process because we're gonna lose him. <laughs> I'm so sad, he's such a great staff person, but um, the, this um, issue of the shifting objects, if we could um, refurbish these drawers a little bit, we could address that issue. Another issue um, Robert was helping us look at actually was these kayaks that are hanging from the ceiling and um, Robert's up on the ladder in the picture to kind of help us figure out how big of a ladder we need to cover these with plastic. 
during the roofing project, but one of my concerns with the gallery refurbishment is that the cables that hold these um, hanging kayaks, there's two of them, from the ceiling, that's the cable that's been under tension for the last 30 or more years. And with time and constant stress and uh, oxygen and relative humidity and oxidation and slow corrosion, it would be really nice if we could put fresh cables on those kayaks because we probably won't have another chance for another 30 years. And those cables are doing a lot of work. So this is one of those um, situations where we're thinking about how we might phase the project and what components of the project we do together. The map on the right shows um, where the, like in the middle is where the totem poles are. And then the next ring of cases are the study storage cases, which are kind of those low beveled white ones in the photo. And it seems like we could take those out one or two at a time, um, deinstall the objects and, and send the cases to be refinished in someone's shop. And if we took those cases out, then we would have the opportunity to bring in a lift that would reach all the way up to the ceiling to allow us to replace those cables. And if we didn't have the chance to take those steady storage cases out of the middle of the room, accessing the ceiling to replace the cables would be really difficult. So some of those phasing questions are um, coming up for us. I'll also point out that that map on the right has a uh, number and letter codes that correlate to every single door in every single case. And I mentioned this because the next slide I'm gonna show you is gonna be too tiny for you to read, but it's the, a page out of the Excel spreadsheet that shows what the exhibit staff and um, curatorial and conservation, we're all putting our notes for every single door and section of the exhibit. So this is what it's looking like full of data, lots of information, lots of planning ahead to think about how we're going to execute this project. Another thing that the conservation team is going to do that um, is going to extend into next summer is these mats that are mounted on the wall. And we're going to upgrade the hanging mechanism for these mats because the plexiglass clips are um, outdated and they're not um, putting even stress on the objects. So there are um, cedar bark, and grass mats on the walls. And they have these plexi clips, which um, are really um, not doing the job as well as they could be. So um, what we'll be doing is taking these mats down, getting rid of the plexi clips and adding a cotton muslin sleeve stitched to the top edge of each of these, which will then hang on these um, slant boards. And again, there's a lot that's going right with these um, displays as, as they are. These slant boards that are on the walls right now are covered with a, a polyester fleece. And the fleece on a slant board is a classic textile display technique because that fleece gives a little bit of friction between the fabric and the object and helps give another um, sort of redundant overall support. There's another vintage picture on the left of the project in the 80s where they were able to close down the building for an extended period of time. And they um, had more space to work in and they could just set up shop right in the gallery. There's not really a great spot for exhibits to set up in, the, um, in Sitka right now and, and certainly not an exhibit shop. On the right, you see a saw and a vacuum cleaner, which was a makeshift way to uh, deal with some uh, work that happened on an exhibit in the past. But this is one of the planning things we need to think about is, is how and where the work will happen for exhibits. Uh, in order to deinstall some of these cases, uh, uh, we're looking to um, uh, borrow or buy for Sheldon Jackson some of these sort of bread carts is what uh, we tend to call them. We moved. Alaska State Museum collections in 2014 with a whole bunch of these uh, bread carts and they're really great for moving objects around. They come in different um, widths and they the shelves are adjustable and you can take them apart with a rubber mallet. And so this might be uh, some uh, equipment that we would consider getting for Sheldon Jackson to expand um, their capacity of what they can be do doing over there. but. Um, aware of the space limitations as well. On the right is an item at the 
Alaska State Museum in Juneau. It's a scaffolding that's on wheels that allows people to work at a height in a way that's um, more secure than a ladder. That also comes apart into pieces. Maybe we take that apart and send it to Sitka for the project, something like that. Here's another little behind the scenes detail we're thinking about. In order to get the collections from the gallery into the secure collection storage um, back behind the office, this is the only door to go through if you're gonna stay inside the building. And the, the door is kind of narrow. It's got a doorknob that sticks out. It's got um, a magnetic door holder behind the door that prevents you from opening the door bigger. So these little details of how are we going to move the objects through the space are also things we're thinking of ahead of time. Remember when I mentioned the color coding in the bottoms of the cases? Like, let's say we didn't want the bottoms of the cases to be pink and blue and orange and whatnot. We wanted to paint them. If we paint the inside of an exhibit case, it needs four weeks to fully off gas and dry. This is a, a diagram that's from a publication about airborne pollutants in museums. So if you could imagine where if we deinstall some of these cases and then we have the objects out of the cases for four weeks before we could put them back in, you can see where there's logistical um, hurdles to overcome. So we might think about, for example, do we um, paint out uh, exhibit materials that, that are painted out ahead of time that we can put in the exhibit case so we don't have to lose four weeks um, in the planning. So some of those logistics we're thinking through. Here's some of the Juno folks who might be involved in the project. This is um, back a couple of years ago when we were um, tearing down the old Alaska State Museum. On the left with the pencil is Addison Field, who's the um, head uh, chief curator, um, runs the museum. And next to him in the purple jacket is Mary Irvin. She's head of security and visitor services. And then on the right, we've got um, Jackie Manning, who's the exhibit curator here in Juneau, and Aaron Elmore, who's the exhibit designer. And certainly Jackie and Aaron will be um, especially involved in the project. And I want to point out that Jackie Fernandez Hamburg has um, experience with doing these big projects and phasing things and moving objects around. This is um, when Jackie came over several times during the um, Alaska State Museum move project and she was in her car hearts and her um, safety gear because the building was under construct time. And um, also I'd mentioned that um, we're part of a larger museum community in Alaska that's very supportive and full of great advice, especially for these Alaska specific challenges that um, museums go through when they're off the road system or um, have these uh, logistical issues. So, you know, Jackie's there on the left on the ladder and next to her um, are uh, kneeling down is Bethany Buckingham from the museum in Wasilla and on the right Haley Chambers that she's in Ketchikan and with the white helmet is Dennis Keough from Cordova. So we have um, other folks that we can uh, check in with on, on scheming these logistics and, and we appreciate that too. So um, I guess so I'll give time for questions and I won't uh, chat anymore here at the end, but thanks for, thanks for listening. So thank you everybody. You are invited to unmute if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Steph. That was wonderful. No question, but thank you very much. It was really interesting. I used to work there. <laughs> Hi, Ellen. It's Rosemary. Hi. Hi. So uh, I'm just interested interested in finding out what the the newest um, techniques are that you're going to use on those old plastic things that I was involved with 30 years ago, 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, what's what's going to replace those? On the mats, you mean? On the, on the mats, yes. Yeah, Yeah. so um, you're probably familiar with the quilt hanging technique where they stitch a right. sleeve on the top back. Uh -huh. I think we're going to do that too with these. We're going to stitch the sleeve on the back. There's a cedar bark robe here at the Alaska State Museum that we're putting on exhibit this summer um, that I stitched a robe to the back and it 
um, it went on really beautifully. And, and then that gives an all, uh, an overall even uh, level of support across the top. And then mm -hmm. the rest of the mat hangs on the slant board, which is assisted by the friction with the polyester um, fleece. Yeah, okay, great. Oh, and I have a question. This is Jackie. Yeah. yeah curious, um, in terms of that shovel that you showed an image of, what are you envisioning for support for that? Are you thinking about some sort of like brass mount that comes out that's padded, that gently holds it in several places, less is less visible? What, what's your perfect ideal kind of mount for that shovel? Well, typically with these kinds of questions, um, uh, Aaron and I, Aaron being the um, exhibits mount maker, uh, we'll get together and we'll look at the object together and I'll say, you know, I was thinking maybe we would do this or that. And then we bat ideas back and forth and Aaron will be like, you know, I had an issue with a similar object and I used this. And so we kind of um, tag team, but that hole that's in the middle, the natural hole that might've been a knot in the wood in the past that they're using to put the strapping through right now you know, one option would be to have a, a peg through that hole that's padded around the edges and is brown and kind of, you know, comes through that hole. So you can still take advantage of using that hole. Um, there are some uh, brass mounts on two sides of that already. So it might be that a combination with a, a peg in that hole and the um, brass mounts to retain it, maybe an extra um, retention brass mount. Um, I think brass mount making is going to be the solution for that and and can work without having that strapping across the front. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ellen, this is Rosemary again. What's the timeline? I mean, that's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, do you have, like, is it going to be a, over the course of a couple of years or? Yeah, this is one of the most challenging things with the project, I think, and, and Jackie's been thinking about this quite a lot in the exhibits, too. I mean, not only do we have a gallery that we'd like not to shut down for the duration of a project, sure. um, we have not enough space to deinstall the whole gallery and, you know, do stuff all at once. We've got a uh, skilled exhibit crew that live in Juno, and, you know, it's kind of hard for them to moved to Sitka for a couple of months, although I think that they would find that enjoyable too in its way. And we have at this point in time, absolutely no money to do that. <laughs> but um, it does seem that in order to keep the galleries open, to have the exhibit crew um, be able to uh, work on the project that we need to cut it into manageable chunks. And so the first bit that we're doing is is coming over and, and doing those mats because there was a little chunk of money and um, and I try to come over every year anyway and so let's get that chunk done so um, there's so much work to be done that uh, that there are phases that make sense like the um, study storage drawers in the middle if we could get a a grant to refurbish those those study storage drawers you know and, and maybe deal with the cables of the of the kayak at the same time. The lighting inside those wall cases, like to replace the fiber optics, that's probably a project. To replace all the labels is probably a project. You know, So there are these um, chunks. So how many chunks and how far apart in time are they is up in the air and, and of course tied to money. So Jackie, yeah. do you have more thoughts on, on phases and chunks? I know that uh, Jackie and Aaron have had a lot of conversations about the issue of dealing with the lighting in the cases and then any touch-ups. Even if we're not necessarily altering the color scheme of the gallery, it's not to say that we wouldn't give it a fresh coat of paint based on the similar color scheme that's already applied. So Jackie and Aaron are struggling because they understand that if you're getting into a case and removing things, obviously it's best to do everything you need to do in the case right then, especially with the yeah. off-gassing replacement of the lights. So you'd wanna paint first and then let it off-gas and then do the lights automatically as opposed to having 
you know, a contractor get in after you've removed everything, redo the lights, with the electrician work, and then put everything back in and then repeat that process for putting either the new planks in or new, um, you know, mount supports that have been touched up and repainted or painted anew. And um, that's a real question for them that they're struggling with. And at the end of the day, the answer to that will just be dictated by money and staff time and what's feasible. And it may be that things have to get done twice <laughs> because there's no other way to do it. Um, but I think that if things are in shovel ready phases and small segments, maybe there'll be a generous donor who will step forward and express interest. We have an estimate for the study storage case work that would take place in the center of the gallery as far as the contractor goes and you know local contractor to literally remove each case work on it in his shop allow it to off gas and then return it and so if we have small double ready pieces like that and they're done in a timely manner we can hopefully get grants or get donors to cover such expenditures one of the issues is that if we get estimates, those estimates are only really good for a year, if not less. So we also have to make sure we can align the timing of the funding with the timing of staff availability and the work and everything else. And we are a staff of two people here um, for a good chunk of the year. So two staff, um, you know, that's not a lot of um, manpower to uh, carry out a project and collection storage has maybe three empty, two and a half empty drawers. So um, as far as storing things go, you don't want to leave things locked up in the building in the lobby area overnight necessarily. That's not necessarily the best <laughs> case scenario. And we want to make sure everything is kept secure. So where do you put it? Maybe we can fit one bread cart or two bread carts in collection storage to not, you know, impinge my workspace and to allow for movement and be able to still be okay with fire code and everything else. Um, so how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and the roof project, I saw a question come through in the chat is going to happen. Uh, I think your question was answered, but that's happening this summer. That funding is set aside and that was pre-allocated and um, we do have a four-year window to use it, but we would like to take advantage of the, um, the expected lower number of um, visitors to the gallery due to the pandemic this summer and fewer cruise ships to take advantage of that and make use of the time we have and work on the roof then. So we'll see, it's all very exciting and I can't wait to see how it all unfolds and where the money comes from and um, how things are, you know, divvied up. Um, and Jackie and Aaron are two of the best exhibits staff people in the whole state of Alaska. So the work that they do will be top notch and high quality and the upgrades will be phenomenal. It's just a matter of working in logistics in a way that works. Um, acknowledging that they have what you guys have three or four galleries that you upgrade there and you have a pretty robust exhibition schedule. How many exhibitions do they put on a year for Juno? Um, somewhere between six and 10, I think. Yeah. So fitting the Sheldon Jackson museum in between um, exhibits is important. And then there's the fact that people have families, you know, children, and it's not necessarily easy to, to leave with a one parent household. So, lots of things to consider, but it's so exciting and I can't wait to see how everything looks, you know, as we get each phase done. Um, the gallery might be a little bit mismatched temporarily <laughs> for a couple months or maybe a year, but in the long run, it will serve the artifacts really well. And aesthetically, it will be an improvement. The artifacts will be better safeguarded. All these conservation needs will be addressed. So it's, it's a job that's important to do, even if it takes a couple of years and multiple grants and multiple very generous donors. 
Ellen, this is Robert. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, <clears throat> you were mentioning a uh, future upgrade for the uh, fiber optic lighting in the cases. Is that just because our equipment is getting old or is there something better than fiber optic now? You know, I think the biggest push is that it's getting harder and harder to maintain and find any replacement parts and that sort of thing. And honestly, that's an issue for museums and, and all buildings is that the lighting, the changes that are happening in lighting and lighting technology is, is leaps and bounds these days. You know, like even five years ago, fluorescents were being like installed in buildings and now everybody wants to put LEDs in buildings. Like the technology is just advanced uh, quite a lot. And so I'm not exactly sure what the, um, the best products are that are on the market right now. But one of the things we always um, press for is for things that are going to be able to be in there for 20 years. We want something that's not um, super fancy designy going to be very difficult to get replacement parts. We want something um, that's going to be a workhorse for the next 20 years because whatever we put in has probably got to be there for at least 20 years. And so we want things that we can repair and we can get replacement parts. We can get at, you know, on a step ladder pretty easily, uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, you're right. Mostly it's that this equipment is obsolete and old. Thank you. And here's a question for either you or Steph. Um, have either of you come across an unsolvable problem? Well, I think um, just to take us a little uh, stab at this right now, I think everything, there are so many pieces that are so hard to figure out how you're going to solve these problems. And like Ellen was just saying with um, the obsolescence of technology and having to readdress it every 20 years, it's just frustrating. Um, but that's where a lot of us, I think, rely on our creativity and our problem solving capabilities and just making connections with people who work in different fields and trying to kind of rethink these things so that they work a little bit better for for everyone um yeah i think there, there's a lot of things that can seem unsolvable but that is part of the challenge that we love to try to solve yeah i'd agree with that you know a lot of things aren't like it's solved or it's not solved. Like so many times it's a compromise. Like you're doing the best you can in the situation, you know, especially in our challenging Alaskan situations. And sometimes there's not a good resolution right now, but maybe a little ways down the line, there might be a good solution or, or a new technology or a new approach. So I think almost everything can be grappled with in, in some ways. Um, but I think, you know, you have to be optimistic in, in this kind of field in order to, to make progress and, and take care of collections. This is Jackie. I've got um, one last question. Steph, I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and some of what you've been dealing with in the lab there in Washington, DC um, and what's next for you? Sure. So I started my, um, so I'm in my third year of my graduate program, which is a full year internship. And because of COVID, I had to split mine up, but I started um, at the National Museum for American History and working on a panel from the side of a wagon from a traveling show of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So it's from 1900 and just full of flaking paint. It was actually found in a shed in the 80s um, in pretty bad shape. So I got to address a lot of the flaking paint and devise ways to clean this paint that is no longer bound to the substrate anymore. Um, so that was an incredibly challenging, <laughs> speaking of challenging, when you're trying to clean something that isn't stuck. So you're just like, the amount of pressure and, and kind of when I was talking about hand skills of just working with things that are so delicate, it's such a frustrating process sometimes, but getting that um, balance is really important. So that was my first chunk of the year. And then the second um, part, I'm at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, and I am working on a um, sculpture by the artist Ava Hesse, 
and it's from 1966 and it's polyurethane and plaster and rope and it hangs from the ceiling and it's in a bad way <laughs> right now um but i'm really excited about it because they are materials that i haven't worked with before and again you kind of feel like it's an unsolvable problem but once you get in there and kind of realize how these materials interact how they degrade what you can use to bridge those gaps um i'm just getting started i'm in my my second week now but um i'm really looking forward to how much I'm going to learn through this second experience as well as I did in the first. Fantastic. Does anyone else have any questions for Ellen or for Steph? No, I think it's pretty quiet. Well, thank you everybody for attending this fantastic presentation yeah. and Steph and Ellen, thank you so much for putting this together. It was so wonderful to have you here in Sitka that the friends jumped at your offering to share this with the bigger community and um, really appreciate you, your willingness to do that and be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, everyone have a wonderful day and this video will be posted to the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum YouTube channel in the near future. You can follow that channel and look online for lots of different Zoom events that we've recorded since we've began to do many Zoom kinds of events. And please try to attend the Saturday, February 6th, Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum annual meeting. We'll have guest speaker June Pardue. She's a Lutik Sukpiak from Old Harbor as a storyteller telling a special story that she wrote herself and that will follow just after a very brief business meeting. So thank you for friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum, always supporting the museum with public programs, education, acquisitions, and um, soon our roof project and our gallery refurbishment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.